Hey Vsauce, Pykel here. I just wanted to do a tour of my home labs. That's what I'm going to do today. Uh, this is kind of a video for anyone who wants to get into virtualization at home or any kind of like running a server at home. Uh, I wanted to show how we do it and you know kind of basically all the services that I'm running, all the different boxes. Uh, I'll just grow, grow through and and yeah, we'll, we'll see if there's anything you guys can make fun of or learn from. So uh, I guess I'll start from the bottom because I think that's actually probably the most important thing in this rack is our UPS. Um, so that's right here. And by the way, we're on carpet, which I'm sure people are going to rag on and you can see the damage that does here. It's not hard to put down hardwood floor or not hardwood, but like you rip up the carpet and put like some speckle down. Uh, and I'd recommend that if you're trying to run like a data center. But this is kind of a temporary thing, so, um, so yeah, we're renting anyway. I don't want to rip up the carpet. Oh yeah, let me get ahead of my dog real quick. She wants to be in the tour. Hello. All right. Anyway, so yeah, UPS. This is kind of neat because when the power goes out, everything's plugged into this battery here. So it's got right now 45 minutes of charge. So if everything were to, uh, if the power were to go out in this building. Everything is actually plugged into this. It's got a bunch of just regular uh, power jacks. It's like a power extender with a battery. So it's called a UPS uh, uninterruptible power supply. Although, you know, after uh, 47 minutes, I think it will be interrupted. So I wouldn't call it uninterruptible. But if there's a flicker in the power, we do not. Nothing goes off. So that's really the the main benefit of a thing like that. It's not like to be your generator if you're in a storm. Although you can totally do that. Um, I can turn all these off when the power goes out and just use this as like a backup battery for charging your phone, but, um, you know, so we've got that and then we started plugging in servers and you'll see these two right here are off. We just kind of have them. We're not using them. They're not in production as you'd say they're development, but I don't know. They're just sitting there. You know, we got a bunch that are just sitting there because we don't need them yet. Um, one of the things I learned about this, uh, is kind of like overkill. Um, so I'll get into that. This is our free NAS box. So this has, I think, a couple of four terabyte drives and they're in RAID, it's either four or eight. Uh, so it gives us like a 12 terabyte storage pool. It's pretty, pretty solid. Uh, we've also got this guy right here, which is our Proxmox box. So we've got FreeNAS on this, running a ZFS, and then Proxmox, which is our hypervisor. Both of these run a couple of VMs and I'll show you in the actual user interface. Um, but we have them separate for different reasons. Like I actually did a video on FreeNAS versus Proxmox, and that's kind of why we run them separately, just because there's benefits of each. Um, this thing was an additional cluster node, so I it was the old one actually. This was our old Proxmox, so I had Proxmox installed, um, migrated all of our containers, uh, and then left the cluster with this one. So that's why this is here. It was the original. Proxmox cluster. If you want to learn a little bit more about the specific hardware, we've got these are two Dells and one HP. Um, what's cool about the Dell ones is a lot of them have iDRAC so that if they're off, you can still turn them on and access them um, from like a separate network interface. It's kind of cool. Oop. Write your name on there. So dusty though. Look at that. Anyway. All right, so up top, and th this is kind of where I was getting at where I said I'll come back to the overkill thing later. This is a laptop. This laptop is kind of what started my virtualization um, binge, and it's running ESXi. This thing has been running ESXi for almost five years now, uh, so four or five years. It's I think I installed it when 6.5 first came out. Um, and basically what this is, is if I lift up the bottom, you'll see there's no lap, there's no battery. It's a big hard drive, um, on a crappy i7 laptop. The display is even toast. Um, and that made that a great candidate for running virtual machines. So I put a VPN on here. I also used to have a Minecraft server and a couple other things, but, um, yeah, what's cool about having an extra laptop like this is that you can turn your entire... Uh, virtual machine infrastructure into something small and lightweight, very low power draw. So until you're actually doing stuff that you think needs server hardware, and boy, it doesn't feel like I need it yet, um, the laptop is fine. And so I actually recommend that to people. Uh, and then last but not least, we've got our KVM, which is just a, um, not even a real computer, it's a keyboard, video, and mouse. Uh, that you plug into each of these servers. We don't even have a KVM switch, so when I want to switch computers that it's plugged into, I literally 
unplug and replug into another server like this. Let's see. There you go. Um, and then you'll see our Proxmox IP address. Uh, from there, everything runs to a router. And right now, I'm pretty ashamed of this because you'll see, what do you want? What? Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, everything runs onto this and it's not plugged into the UPS. So that means that when the power goes out, we do actually lose our IP address. One of these is running a dynamic DNS container, so it'll automatically update. But that's something that in the future I'd like to do. I'd like to go ahead and plug this power into that UPS right there. Uh, the other thing is, this is just our modem slash router. Our actual um, Wi-Fi access point is Ubiquiti, and I recommend these. These are pretty beefy. They're like a mainstay brand. What's cool about Ubiquiti is if you learn it at home, when you go into work, a lot of enterprises like schools, businesses use these. Uh, for mesh networks, so you'll have some experience with the, you know, ubiquity setup. Um, the one thing I would change about this is I want to put a firewall, like a PFSense, um, probably a, a whole dedicated machine to PFSense, but that's later on. So this is what we've got for now, uh, and we will continue this tour virtually. Now we're here in virtual land, and I'm connected to our router, which I don't know that I showed, but it's kind of some piece of crap, um, you know, the one they give you, so, yikes. But once I'm connected to that, I can hit all those IP addresses that are hosted on the rack, and I'm going to start with the one on the bottom, which is the FreeNAS box, and I did another video just comparing these two, because I think that, you know, if you're getting into this kind of stuff, um, it's kind of daunting like which do I choose what do I do and it's funny because they both have their own purposes um, so we use this basically to just turn um, this big storage pool which I it was bigger <laughs> into uh, something that's public and shareable so what that means is this folder right here these network shares uh, they're Samba shares meaning they're um, they're using Windows SMB uh, as the network protocol, so you can access them with the double backslash. Um, getting that set up was as easy as installing FreeNAS and then going over here to sharing. Yeah, Windows SMB shares. All right, and adding a share here. It's it's all GUI. There's no more. So this basically saves you from sitting there and having to tinker with all that manually. It gives you a GUI to manage your shares. Um, you can also add users. So I have a user account that is allowed into these shares and you can administer them here so it really makes it much simpler to um see they're all groups too so that's kind of neat so if robert gets his own custom share um or michael from vsauce he you can be added to michael's uh group so that you can access his share that's that's only if you you know set that up you also get a shell access so if you want to um you know run commands you can do that but this is our free nas box um it's also got a couple plugins running and it's funny plugins are just another way of saying containers if you ask me i don't i'm not crazy about how they went and um called it something different but you'll see we're using two here and they're pretty well named uh next cloud and plex so i i bet you can guess what those are but in case you can't i'll show you um and by the way i strongly recommend oh that's so funny yeah okay so you're not going to be able to hit that but I strongly recommend um, typing these out and keeping track of it with like a spreadsheet or something so that um, as you assign IP addresses, you don't forget what you've already assigned. Uh, another thing I like to do is all, and actually my roommate did this, so I, I shouldn't give myself credit. All of these addresses are under 100 uh, because we set our router up to only issue addresses above 101. So when you connect your phone or your laptop or whatever, your desktop, it's going to be 102, 103, 104. That reserves the entire 100 and below for our infrastructure, which is cool. That way, when I go to make a, a 1.126 uh, here, if I wanted to make some other, you know, network service, uh, I know 6 is available because it's not going to be auto-assigned. So that's kind of cool. Um, so I'm jumping around a little bit, but I think this is important. I'm going to talk about Nginx. Nginx is so freaking huge in terms of like what it has done for network infrastructure because say you're running, well, I'll, I'll actually hit it now. 
say you're running a Nextcloud server at home, and you're also running a, uh, I don't know, like a, and now I don't actually know that all my stuff is up, but here you go. Say you've got multiple subdomains, and they're both on port 80, as you can see here, they're both web services, but they go to two separate virtual machines. Where and how do you route that traffic? Because if you have a simple router like me and you're not running PFSense, which I should be, that means you can only really forward the port to one, one device. So port 80 is only going to go to one thing. And right now that's set up to go to this Nginx router. The reason that's cool is before, without Nginx, I could have either hosted this on port 80 or hosted this on port 80. Uh, and that's it. Uh, I would have had to pick some weird ports for these other ones. With Nginx, I can route all port 80 traffic over to uh, my Nginx instance, which is right here. And then on Nginx, which is just a container, uh, nice and slim, uh, we can create a Nginx profile for each of those different sites, as they're called. So sites available. I think that's listed right here. So this is what that looks like. Um, you would basically just add an instance for each uh, subdomain, and now it's accessible. It'll reroute that traffic. That's something I, I really think that is it was a huge hurdle for me learning because for a while I'm sitting there going, man, how do you host multiple things on port 80 from your house? You just can't do it. Like I was having a Minecraft server and a VPN that's all easy uh, because they use different ports, but oh no, I want to run multiple web services? Nginx. So that's kind of it with that it's pretty straightforward but it took me a long time to find out about it so for a while before i knew it about nginx it was it ended up being a real game changer um the other thing i want to point out i guess is our esxi uh machine and this I, I like to show just because it you know humble beginnings um this is that laptop and at no point did I really grow out of this. Um, I needed more storage, so at one point, like, we got a bigger hard drive. But frankly, what, what I was doing, so I'm running, like, a Node.js server for a Discord bot. Not a, not a hugely intensive thing. Um, or a VPN, so open VPN server. Again, not intensive. Um, that's super easy from this i7 laptop. And so we did end up upgrading to big servers. You know, you saw the Dell, PowerEdge, whatever. But this kind of goes to show you that you don't necessarily need to have a lot of money or a lot of supplies to start learning with a home lab. And um, another kind of ironic thing about this is this has probably been the most stable. Because I'm learning with Proxmox and I'm, I'm trying to figure out like cluster migrations and all that, Having something in the background that you set up and then don't really play with, this this ESXi instance, has provided some stability in that no matter what happens with this, I still have this, and and it gives me network access. So I'm going to cut myself off with one final important note if you're running a home lab. It's two things, really. Dynamic DNS, which makes it so that if you've got any subdomains or domains pointed to your IP address, uh, services that you can access. So when I hit I can has IP.com, this number is going to change when my power goes out for too long and someone else gets issued my IP address from my ISP. So I'll get a new number. And that means all of my subdomain records, all of my domains are now pointing to the old one. They won't work anymore. None of my web services are going to be up. So what Dynamic DNS does is it will log into your respective DNS provider like Cloudflare. You basically paste your Cloudflare key. You can do this for free, by the way. It's actually the best way to run this infrastructure for free. This costs much less than doing Azure or any other cloud service provider because we're all doing DIY. So this is a way to not have to pay for that uh, static IP address. You can get the command DD client and put it on a container. And another thing I really recommend you do if you want an always up infrastructure that you host is going to be start at boot. So that once you've got that power supply, your server rack doesn't go down, but if it does for whatever reason, your servers will turn back on automatically so you can configure that in your BIOS for your server, and then your containers will start up automatically so that really nothing goes down. It's high availability DIY, you know, for free. So that's two things I really recommend is dynamic DNS and start at boot. Anyway, I'll see you guys later. Thanks for watching.